Welcome, friends, to our 102nd online gathering for congregational leaders across the country. This monthly gathering is called Courageous Leadership, and it's sponsored by ELC's Coaching Ministry. I'm Jill Beverly. My pronouns are she, her. I am the program manager for this ministry and one of your facilitators today. As part of my traditional land acknowledgement, I would like you to know that my home is located on the Fox River in Appleton, Wisconsin. This area is the ancestral territory of five nations of Native Indigenous peoples, the Menominee Tribe, the Ho-Chunk Winnebago Tribe, the Potawatomi Tribe, the Oneida Tribe, and the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans, and the Brothertown Community. I honor and respect the diverse Indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live. So as we step into our time today, friends, I also encourage us to remember that we are creating and holding a safe and brave space in these gatherings for you to bring the truth of who you are and how you are doing. These conversations are meant to be an intentional step to live more fully into God's dream for us as the body of Christ. And as the body of Christ, we will start by centering ourselves. And so I do have a PowerPoint to share. I'm hoping that you can all see it. Is there a thumbs up if you can? Okay, so with that, I'm not seeing what I need on my side, which makes that kind of difficult. There we go. All right, so. Here we are with a reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Now, these are the gifts Christ gives us to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do God's work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they should sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And friends, this line bears repeating. Jesus makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What would it look like if we truly believed this? What would it look like if we truly lived this? And with these questions holding tension in our space, let us pray. Gracious God, for each mind and heart that feel, fills the presence of this room, we thank you. Thank you for calling each of us to be part of your body at work in the world. We are grateful for this time to reflect on what it means to work in unity with the fullness of the gifts and talents you have given us. We are humbled by your presence with us, and we thank you for Nathan and the gift of his wisdom and experience that he will share with us today. We lift this time to you, and in your precious name we pray. Amen. And so here is a fun picture, working with teams and groups, leading meetings. It's something that we all do, and it's something that, quite frankly, can raise our blood pressure just thinking about it. As a professional coach in our denomination, I can tell you without breaking any confidences that one of the most talked about topics in my coaching space is how to lead meetings effectively, especially with disparate personalities in the room. Many describe feeling like the dog in this image on the screen. It's a constant balancing act, and it's draining, and it's difficult. 
Most of the pastors I work with that are retiring name being eternally grateful that they will never have to attend another council meeting again in their lifetime. <laughs> but again, what if it didn't have to be this way? What if we were able to harness the gifts and energy of whatever group we are working with and help them move forward in a way that honors everyone in the room? Sounds like a distant dream, right? Well, friends, great news. Our good friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. Nathan Swenson Reinhold is here with us today to help us begin to unlock some of the secrets for navigating this particular terrain in leadership. Nathan, it will be fun to have you introduce yourself. Welcome to our space. Thank you, Jill, so much. And so good to see um, so many of you who I know, some I don't know, but want, I'm deeply appreciative that you've shown up today. Um, uh, I thought that you actually shared that picture, Jill, because that's a picture of my life. I feel like I'm juggling all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I thought I was doing myself a solid. I, I uh, have been a, a parish pastor for the past 17 years, but I, I'm married to a pastor as well. And she just stepped into a new call out of the, uh, um, she was the assistant to the Bishop for Candidacy and Mobility in the Metro DC Senate and is now the pastor for group life at Preston Meadow Lutheran Church in Plano, Texas. So at the beginning of July, we relocated our lives to Frisco, Texas. And uh, um, there wasn't a congregational container that was a good fit for me. Um, so I took that as a Holy Spirit opportunity to step full-time into coaching and consulting where I get to work with leaders who work on churches um, and with teams that work in churches. And I'm excited about this shift and still trying to figure it out. But um, so the picture that Jill had up is an app description for what it's like sometimes leading in team spaces and group spaces for sure, but it is a constant depiction of my own life. And, uh, I thought, Jill, that was a picture that came out of your own experience with me over how many years. <laughs> so I was, <laughs> I'm always looking for emails and communications. Hey, Jason, can you send that to me again? I don't know. Can any of you relate? Um, so many moving parts, so many different fronts that I feel like I'm working at all the time. So anyway, it's a privilege to be in this space. I see some of you who have done actual team coaching training with me before. Um, Barbara, it's fantastic to see you. Uh, Ken Taylor, it's fantastic to see you. Um, and then uh, Kimmy Meineke, you're signed up for next week, which is awesome. So the presentation I put together today talks about team and group coaching dynamics without doing the content of that. So if you still want to have that experience, there's going to be some overlap, obviously, um, I think, but I think only two slides that I use are actually used in that presentation. So um, hopefully this builds on that. If you want further uh, conversation, and for those of you who've done team and group coaching, hopefully this is a nice recap and a little bit different way of talking about it. So hopefully we all win. And if you've never done any of it before and are just coming to be edified, I pray that that's the outcome of the next 30, 45 minutes, um, however long this takes. So that's that. Um, uh, let me um, let me go ahead and share my screen and go big. I'm calling today's conversation "Moving People: A Summit Team Coaching Overview" in in partnership, obviously, with EL ELCA's Courageous Leadership. And Jill, I think it's amazing that this is the 102nd episode. Um, it's phenomenal. Um, yeah, Nathan, you were one of our very first ones in. I I think in I was the first one. March of 2020, yes. <laughs> I and think so I was. I should have named that. I apologize. No, it's okay. It's okay. It was great to partner in that space that time, and it's great to be back. You've had me a couple other times, too. Um, this is a little bit about me. I'm married to Erin. She's the pastor in the middle there, um, if you can see that on your screen. We've been married for about 25 years. Our oldest is a recent college graduate. For those of you who can relate with graduating kids out of school, um, and know what a significant event that is. And he's not living at home, which we're excited about. And he's gainfully employed. And he says it's not enough money, but he's figuring it out anyway, because we're not sending him extra checks. So um, my middle son is about to go to Texas A&M here in three, four weeks. And my uh, Ephraim and then my daughter there uh, next to her mom is a rising eighth grader and is actually excited about this move. Um, she's been all over that um, I'm a pastor with 17 years leadership experience, 15 of those in, in large congregational systems. So teams and groups was something that I've had to bump around with 
with mass. It's not to denigrate people who work in other opera, other uh, cultures, but it's just, it's been something I've been noodling and wrestling with for a long, long time. And this whole conversation is a distillation of that kind of experience for me as a leader and as a coach. Um, I do hold a PCC credential. I've got over a thousand hours of seat time now. Um, I was just figuring that up and about 145 unique clients, um, individuals, teams, and organizations, um, which is a lot. That's incredible, um, at least in my brain. I'm a certified DISC behavioral consultant. Um, I do have a, a doctorate in leadership and cultural architecture, and then I have my own sh shingle, uh, Summit Coaching and Behavioral Consulting. Most recently, I'm now a consultant as well with GSB Fundraising. If you've heard of GSB, hopefully you perceive them well. Um, it's actually the thing I'm most excited about right now because it is a phenomenal group of leaders and consultants who do really, really great work with congregations and nonprofits, strategic planning, fundraising, et cetera. Anyway, that snapshot of me. What I like to do in these spaces, and I'm assuming that the folks we have here today, some of you are trained coaches. All of you are leaders. So whether you're a coach um, identified, been trained or not, or a leader, I still want to start with a coaching definition, my coaching definition, because I think, I think um, it gives us a baseline for conversation about how we as leaders operate in relationship to others. I am convinced that a coaching posture is the most powerful posture that we can take, especially if we care about the development of um, the teams, groups, and systems around us. And so it's where I like to start. So um, my definition is that coaching is a relational alliance that produces new awareness, clarity, and agency for the sake of the client and for the achievement of their goals. If you want to take a snapshot of that and use that in your own life and work, I'm totally fine with that. Um, please use it. Um, but I'm curious how that definition is resonating or connecting with you today. And you can drop comments in the chat. I can't see that right now, but I know Jason and Jill probably can. And uh, or you can just unmute yourself and start talking. But let's start here. This is the baseline for our conversation. One comment in the chat. I love relational alliance. Thank you for that. What do you love about it? Whoever wrote that? That was from Sarah, if you would like to unmute. Oh, geez, that's complicated. I was just going to keep chatting. Um, it's so descriptive. And it's, it, it's the goal for any coaching relationship, that it is connected and that we are working together towards the client's goal. Their goal becomes my goal. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah, for answering. Who else? And then Sunny put in new awareness, really, hit. How, how, tell me more, Sunny. Why is new awareness hitting you today? Um, I just think right now in the midst of everything, um, for one thing, everything feels new and we're kind of getting tired of that. But to add the new awareness and really focus on what it is that, that we're learning and to be open to surprises. Um, so that just grabbed me. Thank you. That's really, really great articulation of that. How about one more? Raymond, did you unmute? I did. I was going to say, I like to focus on for the sake of the client and for the achievement of their goals. It's not about me. It's about you or whoever you is. Yeah, I'll tell you personally, one of my favorite things about coaching is it, it deconstructs my narcissism. It's one of the few spaces where I'm trained to show up and be wholly present for somebody else. And it's actually made me a better father, a better husband, a better leader. A better human um, because I don't know that I knew how to do that. I didn't have a, a practice, a modality where that was the goal, um, was to be wholly there and present for another. So for me, I know some people are wired for that. Um, though you Enneagram twos out there know what I'm talking about. Um, you embody this. Um, I'm an Enneagram four, I don't. And, um, and for me, it made me a better human. How about one more? You guys are doing great with this. I love your reflections. There have been several more in the chat, but I'm going to invite, if somebody just wants to unmute, go for it. Nathan, I, I love that Barbara put in the chat, agency can be 
a problematic word, part of our coach speak, but it might not mean anything else to non-coaches. So I wonder how you would unpack that. I love the word agency. And I actually appreciate that, um, that lob over the net and the invitation to engage that. Um, I don't even know that it's coachy language because I don't even hear agency a lot in coaching circles. Um, personally, um, if some of you have different experiences, I honor yeah. that, but I don't hear it a lot. It's a word I love. I'm hearing it more and more in culture. And I think it revolves around this ongoing sense that we are all overwhelmed and feel like we are beset and assailed by forces beyond our control. So we are dealing with human beings everywhere, every corner of this planet, who feel like circumstances and the world have exceeded their be ability to manage or be in control in, in any way, shape, or form. I think one of the things that coaching does for us uniquely is it gives us back our empowerment, our alignment. We may not be totally in control of circumstances, but we always have agency, the ability to do with purpose, constructively, for the sake of life, mission, fill in that blank. That's what agency is. It's the ability to act in circumstances, regardless of what they are. Um, and we see that, of course, in some of the greatest human beings throughout time. Jesus, of course, but um, um, who's ever read Viktor Frankl? Or I mean, just there's just so many phenomenal people we could point to out there who were in powerless situations. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who uh, had letters and papers from prison found agency um, confronting his death, empowering others in prison, and then empowering us here how many decades later. So there's always an opportunity to act, and the question is, what is your opportunity to, to act, to choose a constructive way forward? Coaching as a modality always ends there. It gives the client a constructive opportunity to do something with their life, with their new awareness and their clarity, and I love that about it. Jason? Uh, do we have time for one more? Ken and sure. raise his hand. Go for it. Ken, would you like to go ahead and share? You know, I was I was actually gonna talk about this this um, agency idea um, that there's the clarity is to instill the agency in the client, not so much trying to overpower some some form of external extrinsic kind of um, viewpoints or ideologies on the client, but it's actually discovering and bringing to blossom that internal agency, that it, uh, intrinsic kind of value. Of, but what I just said was kind of paled in comparison than what you just said, so that's fine. <laughs> no, that's really, really helpful, and it's important to define. So awareness is over can be very, very um, overwhelming for our teams, our groups, our clients. Um, we as human beings intentionally mute awareness in so many different ways. This is why substance abuse is at an all-time high. This is why, right, because there is so much noise. We can only, our circuits can only take so much. What coaching does is it uniquely invites your team or group to take information, to become aware of forces that are acting on it. And because you cannot humanly respond to everything, the clarity is what is most important for us to focus on. I'm getting ahead of myself. But when you get a team or a group talking about that, narrowing that stuff down, now we've got one to three things. Now we can move those, those finite things into action. So clarity allows us to ultimately get from awareness to the things that are assailing us or the things that we need to be dealing with or aware of into a place where we identify what's most important and can choose action. So it's, yeah. It's reductive, but it's the fundamental movement of coaching. So um, thank you for that, Ken. I'm not gonna spend time on the ICF's definition today, but I do want to talk with you all about what are the unique challenges of coaching groups of people? I want you talking about this. What are the unique challenges of coaching groups of people? There are this. many. There are yeah. many opinions and perspectives. Yes. There are many minds. Jason? I would add agendas. There are many agendas. Yep. Fantastic. What else? 
your your first job is to figure out if they want to go in the right direction and that can be the worst part is figuring out what direction people are headed yeah yeah you're teeing up well the conversation about the difference between a team and a group but i'm not ready to go there yet let's continue to crowdsource this what are the unique challenges of coaching groups of people they can be complex it, it can be complex conflicting yes they sure can absolutely what else i think uh establishing some kind of equanimity or or balance amongst the group yes okay uh, managing forces of power what else jason i'm sorry uh, yeah some things from the chat uh many abilities anti-corporate impulse and honoring people but not letting someone take the floor and never let go <laughs> yep, we've all had the experience of the person who uh, who monopolizes the entire space and the facilitator who doesn't stop that person, right? Um, or the processes and ground rules that weren't set up to manage how much time and space and air we were going to give to everybody and how we were going to do process, all that stuff. How about a couple more? You guys are doing great. Let me refine the question. Let me ask it a different way. What has been your greatest challenge? in the coaching and or leading of groups of people? I would use your awareness question around um, capacity. Like some people either don't know their own capacity or the capacity of the group. Can you say more about that, Jason? Because I actually think that's really important. I um, think you're going. I mean, the latest things for me lately and so my coaching is uh, people's emotional capacity. Um, so just like wanting to achieve big things, but not realizing where they are around certain things in their life. Yeah. And then, then having awareness of like, oh, wait, <laughs> I actually can't do that big thing right now. Like I do not have the capacity to get there. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Can well, and related to something you said earlier, that 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 driving question of what's most important is that when people feel so overwhelmed, they have a hard time sifting through all the stuff, all the things, and then to really focus in. They just have a hard time doing that ta that prioritization task. That's been yeah. my experience. Thank you, Kimmy. That's a great observation. How about one or two more? For me, it's the person who comes back meeting after meeting with the same issue seemingly it's addressed and the person seems satisfied but comes back again and again and again and trying to figure out what it is that's prompting that repetition. Well, and that's a good reminder. Um, Carol, was that you who said that? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a good reminder that no system is a closed system where people are concerned. People are always showing up to meetings, to conversations, to coaching sessions, bringing everything else behind them with them. I would also say that um, people that think they know, they think they know certain things but don't and, and are trying to make sure that the facilitator or the person that's bringing the information doesn't... Um, bum rush everybody so they think they got to be in control yeah thank you pastor david that's really fantastic great yeah brother ken yeah i was going to say that um it, it, as far as like working with a group over a period of time i think a challenge of of creating continuity between each meeting where where it's actually moving rather than i think it was it might have been carol who said it, it almost like you get stuck in that first meeting and, and you can't keep moving either due to just an inability to let go and grow or yeah. or also just having people just not even think about the concepts or the challenges in between meetings. So you're almost having to like start all over again to yeah. get everybody back on the same page. And That's I was really just jumping off of Carol. Yeah, though. No, it's a really great observation. And I'm seeing that in other environments where I'm doing some group mentor coaching right now where one of the things it's been hard to get this initiative off the ground and some congregations going in it. And one of the things that the coaches are noticing is that paying attention to rhythm um, is really, really important. And that in coaching, if you're doing coaching once every three months, 
it's impossible to get into a rhythm. You have to retread the tire every single time. So there is a frequency. Human minds can only hold so much information and paying attention to that is really, really important. So Ken, thanks for teasing that out. Um, here's the next question. How do you know if you're coaching a group or a team? How do you know? And I know some of you know um, who've gone through the training and you're gonna see the slides I show. So you know they're coming. I would really like it if somebody who's not done the training would, would uh, noodle this first. Are they cohesive? Okay, cohesive. Define cohesive. That's great. Um, they, they appear to have a, a common goal and are willing to bring diff their differing skills to bear on that goal. Okay. This is the fundamental difference between teams and groups. Teams have uh, a unified group or unified goal. Groups do not. Now, here's the deal. Group coaching is a legitimate form of coaching. The problem is if you're coaching, a, let's say, a congregational council, and they say we're a team, but they're all showing up with different agendas, different goals, different priorities. In that instance, you're coaching a group, and your first job is to get them in alignment so they can be coached as a team. Otherwise, your work is for naught. But there are times that we get groups of leaders together. They're all working their own issues, their own needs. And you can do group coaching en masse in those kinds of formats. Uh, an example of this is Vistage International, which is a, a coaching organization for our CEOs and C-suite leaders. I was privileged to be a part of one, um, a cohort and during my time in Florida, 2010 to 2015, I think. And that was where you gathered together once a month for a day and you did a, a day long executive meeting and we worked each other's issues. So we were present to each other. It was a group form of coaching. Um, but the issues that I was bringing to the table as a nonprofit weren't the same thing, the kind of issues that the, uh, the con concrete contractor was bringing to the table. Um, exact, you know, But there was spillover and, and while he was working on his financial statements, I could be reflecting on mine, right? So that's group coaching versus team coaching where there is individuals and or team are aligned in a common purpose or goal. Um, so the challenge for us as coaching coaches is knowing what space we're occupying, what the why of it is. Um, it's nice when you know that you're coming to coach a group that's the purpose. I'm coaching a group of coaches who are all working on their own projects with congregations right now. That is group coaching. Um, that's versus the uh, councils I'm coaching right now. Theoretically, those are team coaching. They are working with me on specific goals. They are theoretically in alignment and we're going the same direction. Questions, comments, insights, wonderings from that. I know that this is really basic, but man, it explains an awful lot. And if we don't have our head wrapped around this on the front end, don't know what we're doing, then we don't know what our first steps are. This is a really, really important conversation. So when I was going into a sales position, I was told, do not sell to a committee. Let them know you need one voice from the committee. So is that really the first task is to You know, they may say they, uh, I got to think about this more. Sorry. <laughs> no, let me, let me jump on that where I think you're going, Sarah. And let me see if, the, let me, let's see if this is helpful. When you're coaching teams, teams don't usually come to you for coaching. An individual on a team comes to you for coaching, a facilitator, facilitator, a mediator, somebody. Invariably, we always work primarily with one human being to begin with. Mm-hmm. So the challenge is, even as we're working on our covenants, putting that stuff together, we'll do that with one individual usually, but that thing still needs to be shared with the team. And then what I do when I come in in the first session is I make sure that the conversation I've had with the team facilitator and where the facilitator says the team is and where the team actually is are the same thing. I still have to true it up. Mm -hmm. I still have to assess alignment. Yes. And if there's a little bit of a, you know, if they're a little bit out, then we got to work together to bring those things together. So that's actually rarely happened to me. Maybe that's surprising. But usually if a congregational president, by the way, more often 
presidents come and ask me for coaching than pastors do. I just find that fascinating. Um, so, but Sarah, was that helpful? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Anybody else want to reflect on this or maybe take it a different direction? So here's a key concept that runs through all of this, and it's alignment. Alignment's necessary whether you're coaching a group or a team. They're just different kinds of alignment. If you're coaching a group, invariably they're there for the same purpose, i.e. to be coached on their respective issues. They may not be pointed at the same thing, that's fine, but there's an agreement about why we are here. That's alignment. Let me say that again. There is agreement about why we are here. Teams, it works the same way. There has to be an agreement about what we are here for. And agreement on one point is all that's necessary to get started. Sometimes you'll have teams that are agreed that we need to work on a certain destination. But they're not in agreement about why exactly they're there. <laughs> Sometimes you'll have teams that are in agreement that they need to be there they need to be in coaching, but they aren't clear together about the destination. I don't care about that. As long as I have one point to work with folks that I can focus people on, going back to this image, then we can, then we're in business. We can work. Because at that point, you get to be in a pure coaching kind of position with your teams. You get to say, all right. You're clear about this is where you are. Remember from Coaching 101 years ago, for those of you who went through it, X arrow X, remember that you are here. Tell me about what it looks like to be here. And as the team works that destination, hears each other talk, the whole process of getting people talking about that creates alignment. Because at some point, you get all sorts of spitball stuff on the table, all sorts of things on the whiteboard, and you can say, these are all the things that you've said. What are the three things that are coalescing is really important in this conversation. You have to do the reductive work. You have to ask the questions that help them focus and bring it down. But you ask them the question, you let them choose the destination. And then all of a sudden, you have not one point, you've got two points. Right? And when you've got two points, now you can plot a journey. So we're clear now that we're here. And we're clear now that we want to go here. How do you want to go about that journey? Are you with me, folks? Put amens in the chat <laughs> if you're following. Okay, Kimmy, I like that. Um, I can only see a handful of you right now. So, But this is how you work. So you do not need teams to be in agreement on every point. I hear coaches will say this, but they weren't in agreement on these things. That's your job as a coach. And if you're handed a team that's not in alignment on anything. What I will do if I'm in person is I will stand in front of a whiteboard. If I have access to it, I'll draw the picture. X, arrow, X. And I'll say, we've got to be in agreement on some things or we've got to come to agreement. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And what do we want to do? And then I'll say, where would you like to start? And we're off and we're running. Make sense? And somebody will say, okay, let's start at the beginning where we are. Great. Are you all willing to do that? And you get buy-in from people and you're off and you're running. Okay, now tell me about your current context. Awareness, what's going on? What's it look like, feel like, smell like, taste like to be where you are? So you're all getting on the same page and then you're working your process. Am I making sense? I know that this seems really basic. But I see all the time, we don't do this. We don't do this well either as coaches and we don't do it as leaders. The leadership process looks the same. It's the same thing from a facilitative conversation. Unless you are an uber authoritarian leader and you're telling people, this is where we're starting, this is where we're going, and this is how we're going to get there. I will tell you from a leadership perspective, there are times of existential crisis where that kind of leadership may be appropriate. My own leadership perspective is 
when possible, whenever possible, you want people to bring their heads and their hearts to the table. And the only way to get them to do that is to invite them to participate in the journey. And that's where coaching wins every time. And we don't get just employees and we don't get just partners, um, um, associates, whatever the case may be. We get people who are bought into the process and bought into the mission because their contributions matter and are part of the conversation. That's where coaching wins every time. Questions, comments? So this alignment thing is important, but alignment can start with just a single point. Um, so you just heard how I work alignment. What other kinds of questions could you ask that facilitate alignment within a team? Discover value, shared values. That's a great, great point. What are the thing, what are the values we can agree on? It's a great question. In fact, that's a fundamental question. All of my team coaching goes there at some point in the first conversation. Because that gives your boundaries and it helps create coherence. It it defines the how we're going to do our work together and probably how it's going to be shaped. Thanks, Ken, for pointing that out. What else? That was great, Ken. Just a reminder, I can't see um, chat section. So I'm going to assume that Jill and Jason are still around and can call out chats if people are dropping things in the comment section. So everything that's popping into my head feels more like I would be identifying where there isn't alignment, but is that valuable as well to start moving them towards recognizing where they need to come together? Yeah, you, you can come at it. Um, I don't like it, but. You can come at it from that standpoint. Sarah, what would the risk of that be, of approaching it that way? Flipping chaos. Yeah, well, you're going to have chaos probably one way or the other. So here's how I think about this. I'm concerned about what parts of people's emotional and cognitive selves I'm tapping into. How we frame questions taps into different energies. Um, there are times that we need to focus on the negatives, but if I'm trying to build coherence, I go to shared values. Mm -hmm. I approach it that way because again, the point is alignment. If I've done that for a good period of time and I'm still feeling like things are out of alignment, then I may ask people to name the elephant in the room at that point. I'll go there, but I want to keep things in a very positive, emotionally open space. As soon as we start moving into negative spaces, if people get reactive, then people's brains are starting to shut down. Now, I know we human beings are only limbic systems, and this whole neocortex was evolved just to support and justify our emotional reactions. And I'm sorry if that doesn't meet your high-minded perceptions of yourselves, but that, that's human beings. So I know that there are two primary motivators when I'm dealing with people. There's fear and inspiration. Fear shuts people down. Inspiration opens people up. Connecting alignment opens people up. I want for good process, whether I'm coaching a, a person or persons, to do things as a coach that facilitate as much emotional and cognitive openness as possible. I will get much better results with and for them than if I am getting backing them into a corner of fear. And Sarah, I don't think that's what you were saying. No, but no, but I, I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't finding the yeah the positives. Yeah. Well, sometimes you don't. But still, starting with the okay, tell me what can hold us together here. What can we agree on? And if you can't agree on values, sometimes it's something physical. It's going to the concrete. Can we agree on our situation? What can we agree on about our current situation? Or 
what can we agree on about where we, we need to be? So again, you've got options and probably there's a dozen, two dozen, three dozen more options even than what we're surfacing right now. And we don't have time to get to all those today, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. Here's what I wanna to present to you. In all of the literature related to team coaching, there's the concept of the funnel. It's the most fundamental process. And that's actually what for me, because the funnel needs a name and it needs a conceptual idea. And that's what awareness, clarity, and agency is all about. It's a reductive process that takes the constellation of thought, of disparate thought and awareness and everything that's going on and invites individuals and teams to figure out what's important to focus on because you cannot focus on everything. Everybody say that. You don't have to turn on your mics. Just say it out loud. We cannot focus on everything. And the bigger the group, the more reductive the conversation has to be, the less nuanced. It's just the way that it works. So um, honestly, if you're working a team in a 60 to 120 minute session, working on one thing is enough. So you've got to get them in agreement about what the, the thing is. Uh, remember um, City Slickers? What's the one thing? <laughs> you got to get them into the, the one thing conversation. What's the most important thing? Maybe not the most important thing for all time, but what's the most important thing for this next 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes? What's the most important thing? And let's focus on that. So awareness, clarity, and agency. We're always dealing with a funnel in some way, shape, or form. Um, and I do talk about this in the fuller thing. I've got a visual and model for it, but think funnel. And I like the funnel methodology, both for teams and for individuals. I'll give you a teaser. Just like teams and groups are made up of many minds, so are single individuals. And when you figure that out, then you really start to understand the difficulty and dynamism and possibility and risk of coaching. Our neuroscience is saying that we are a lot of overlaying programs, autonomic response processes for different situations. We have multiple minds, which is why, Sarah, thank you for teasing this up because it's a great insight to play into. Paying attention to the language that we use, the kinds of questions we ask, and the spaces, the human spaces that we're accessing, what we're accessing is really, really important. So we don't have to be in control of the situation, but we have to partner well. And again, I have a bias towards opening people up, not shutting people down, um, because I believe that produces greater coaching results. And in fact, I think if you pay attention to ICF core competencies and what they're getting at, they're pointing at the same things. This is my language for the same process. I'm just coming at it from uh, an EQ, an EQ IQ space rather than a pure coaching space. Using as the funnel as an image, what kinds of questions um, could you use that would help a team move towards alignment? Ken, please. What is needful now? What is needful now is a great question. And that's a clarifying question. What else? By the way, if you're putting things in the chats, just unmute yourself so I could hear you. Again, I can't see chat and I don't want to miss... I don't want to miss anybody else. What other kinds of questions could you use that would help a team move towards alignment? I think Lois's chat from earlier, uh, but right before you moved on, is what are the team or group's strengths? Excellent. Yeah. That's an aligning question. What's important right now? What's important right now? Thank you, Kimmy. You guys are doing great. Keep it up just a little bit more. What can we set aside? Yes. And that's a space, Sarah, where, where, um, where um, 
a constructive no is super helpful. Again, we can't say yes to everything. So what are we going to say yes to? What are we going to say no to? Great. You guys are doing great. How about two more? What is God calling us to do? Why not invite God into the conversation? <laughs> Which can be, honestly, an incredible complicator. Uh, people hear God very, very differently. Mm -hmm. That said, to ground our common work and prayer and reflection has an aligning quality to it all the time. What do you have? What do we have energy for? Yeah, because sometimes the best ideas are ideas that are beyond our current energetic means, and identifying that's a part of the the journey. That's great. Thank you, Kimmy. That's fantastic. Jason? Oh, you just showed up on my screen again. I figured you came back for a reason. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's, I see Gretchen unmuted. Go ahead, Gretchen. Oh, I was going to say, what are we good at? Yeah. Because we're not good at everything. It's great. Great <laughs> clarifying question. What else? And what I like about that question, Gretchen, is it's both an awareness question and it's a clarifying question. It does both in one fell swoop. And we can use the answers to empower our agency later on. Working out of our strengths and not our weaknesses. Maybe managing our weaknesses to use Gallup language. Okay. All right. Oh, Jason, go ahead, please. You got one more? Just saw in the chat. Uh, which one of these will be the most energizing or will provide the biggest impact? Yes. I like that kind of thinking and that kind of approach to questions. When we're plotting initiatives with teams, usually there's one focal point that does the heavy lifting. If we gave our best energy to that one thing, it would accomplish 60 to 70% of what we actually want to get accomplished. And when you can help a team realize that, then all of a sudden they're not trying to put their eggs in eight or nine different baskets. They're okay putting their energy in one, one or two primary things and doing it well. And it has greater impact for outcomes than anything else. Because guess what? Again, we're finite and we can't do everything. Thank you for that. It was really good. So this is a real basic kind of over overview um, of this. And aside from the awareness, clarity, and agency conversation that I'd love for you to take and be portable, I think it's really useful. I use it in my leadership, much less my coaching all the time. And it's great for working with individuals and it's great for working with teams and groups. Please take it and use it. Um, I'm curious what else you might be walking away with that's helpful for you today because we're already at time. I think I was supposed to take 30 minutes. I'm sorry, guys. I'm grateful Jill and Jason didn't shut me off. So that I can bring to my council. What's that? I'm grateful for this list of, list of questions that I can bring to my council after our first year together. Fantastic. Thank you, Gretchen. Who else? I'm curious, for those of you who've done team coaching with me before, what do we talk about that maybe is new or you're hearing in a different way? Barbara, I bet you've got something. I know you. Yeah, you, you do. <laughs> I, 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 what I am walking away with today is just that, that image of the funnel. Because now I do the reduction piece, but, but having that image uh, is, is my big takeaway today. That helps. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, Barbara. Nathan, what caught my attention was your phrase, constructive no. <laughs> I have clients who struggle with how do I do less? I'm overwhelmed. And everything I'm trying to do is so important. 
And if we can frame it as a constructive no, I think that's going to help them. It's fascinating that you tease that out. I heard my daughter talking with my spouse last night about learning how to say no to things. She's 13. It was a fascinating conversation. I honestly don't know that I know how to say no to things. Like I think I'm a horrible model. Thank you, Carol, for that. That was a gift to me today. How about two more things? And then we'll give it back to Jill and Jason. I just, this is Sunny. I, I just really appreciate going back to the basics again. Because mm -hmm. I just think um, we're all dealing with what I would define as groups, not teams. And, and they're just stuck in a circle. I mean, they're just spinning around and um, they're finding excuses for why they can't go forward, but we're missing the tools to help them go forward. So um, I appreciate just the reminders that these are the basics and how as I'm meeting particularly with a variety of church councils, I, I need to remember these and, and they slip away. You get caught in consulting. Yeah. The fundamentals are magic for a reason. And I think they feel so basic that we tend to overlook them as essential. But if you look at all the best sellers, they're all about fundamentals. Hmm. They're rarely about nuance. I, w I would like to echo um, what Sunny was talking about. At for me today has been a great reboot um, because there's just been so many things that have been going on and and just really trying to um, kind of navigate through, you know, is the pandemic over? Is it not over? Um, do we still have a government? Do we, <laughs> do, does anybody care? Um, you know, just all these things, you know, global warming, all this stuff. And this has been really helpful for me to just kind of reframe and um yeah so thank you for the opportunity thanks brother ken for being here really appreciate it friends unless there's something else i just want to say thank you uh for being here and being part of this conversation uh to jill and jason for inviting me back um to equip and empower which i'd love to do it's my life's passion and mission and uh and if you're more interested in this conversation and want uh eight CCEs um, through the ICF, or even if you don't want eight CCEs, but want to hang out with me for a day, um, got a team coaching training next week. Would love to have you in it. And Jason can tell you how to get connected to that. Thank you, everybody. I'll stay on, but I really appreciate appreciate all of you handing this back over. And we thank you so much, Nathan, for this. So many nuggets of wisdom. Yes, thank you, Barbara, for starting the, the applause. Jason has put in the chat a way for you to sign up for the Fuller training um, to really take a deeper dive with some of these beginning concepts that, that Nathan has um, created out for us today. And, and really want to reinforce, friends, that you don't have to be a coach to attend that training, even though it's framed under our ministry uh, of coaching ministry, we've had many leaders um, attend that are not priorly trained in coaching that have walked away saying, I feel like I can really facilitate a meeting now, a fruitful meeting. Um, Nathan, for me to answer some of the questions that you had out there, I think that the image that I'm going to build on, on the funnel image, and one of the things I love about the funnel is that in that funnel, you can honor all of the different perspectives that are swirling, right? Because I think that the misnomer that we have as a team is that we have to see absolutely everything the same. And that's so not true. And what Nathan is, is proposing to us is that there's a way to acknowledge those differences. And even what Brother Ken just talked about, everyone sitting in that team or in that group that you're walking with comes with the layers of all of those larger existential questions and, and things on their heart, climate change, government, all the things, um, COVID. And then in their own lives, they have their own dumpster fires that have different names on them that they're handling. 
And so there's a way to honor all of those different things. But then when you ask those questions of alignment, it's like, okay, what, what are those things that we can choose to focus on? And it doesn't dishonor those other things. And how would we be different if we could really live in a space where those things are honored? And, and what I will propose to you is one of the greatest benefits in, in this is getting off the hamster wheel. I can't tell you how many times I've walked into a, a, a council meeting thinking it's the same meeting, just a different day and just a different day, you know, different month that, and so here we are again and again. And friends, what Nathan is talking about will help you get off the hamster wheel. And people want to come to those meetings. They want to come feeling like they're moving forward. And so with that, again, thank you and, and bless you for sharing your, your wisdom, your experience, your talents with us, Nathan. Um, please share this link to sign up. If you know that you have a colleague that's struggling, get them to that training. Next Wednesday, friends, is the first Wednesday of the month. So we will be gathering here again our small groups by topics. Know that um, that's something that is, is cherished in, in our courageous leadership space. And with that, as we close, a reminder that you are each seen. You are each valued. You are each beloved. And what an honor and a privilege it is to journey with you as we do the kingdom work together. God bless you, friends. We'll see you next week. Thank you again, Nathan.